It gives me real pleasure to introduce this afternoon session. Um, we have Stephanie Weber, who is in charge of Germany, which is quite a feat. Yeah. We have Daniel, who used to be in charge of Sweden, but now is in charge of Europe. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> and we have Felipe, but they're coming in different orders. Um, so, the, f the, and the, the, the subject of this afternoon is really about getting into the nitty gritty of making things happen. So, how to develop an approach to uh, the deployment of semantic standards and e health network standards generally. And I believe Stephanie and Daniel are going to do a double act. Is that right? How are you going to do that? Just use one? You're just going to move about. Okay. Fantastic. Well, I don't think I need to say anything more. Welcome and thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Charles, for uh, the introduction. Uh, as you said, Daniel and I would share the presentation. So um, we have put the two logos or the two color schemes on our starting slide to show this. Um, if, oh, I have the clicker here, right? Yes. So I'll start with a quick introduction of myself. I'm Stephanie Weber. I'm uh, from uh, an organization which is part of the Ministry of Health in Germany. I'm uh, the national, we have the National Release Center for SNOMED CT as well, and I'm vice chair of the General Assembly. And my name is uh, Daniel Karlsson. I'm from the Swedish eHealth Agency. I'm uh, no longer at the National Release Center. If you want to speak to the Release Center, we have two representatives uh, right in front here. You could raise your hands. Uh, I'm with the Swedish eHealth Agency. I think we are one of the, at least one of the largest users of SNOMED in Sweden, uh, particularly for the national medication list. There's a lot of SNOMED going in there. Uh, we're also responsible for the international uh, collaboration in, in uh, when it comes to e-health. So. Okay, so then I'll take uh, a couple of slides in the first part. I'll give you a little introduction of what we're going to talk about. Um, we're here both uh, mainly because we're in the capacity as well of being chairs of the subgroup on semantics of the e-health network. I'm the former chair and this is the new chair, so that is why we're giving this talk about uh, the European health data interoperability, about the subgroup on semantics, about the guidelines that we have developed and lessons learned we have uh, from that. You have heard a lot about this from the previous talks in the morning already. We're going to deep dive a little bit in a more practical approach on this. So um, looking at the history uh, as well, some, some of the abbreviations, some of the timelines came up uh, as well. The EPSOS, you've heard of this a project that really kicked off uh, this um, cross-border data exchange. Uh, there is a very important date with 2011 where the patient mobility directive uh, came into force and the eHealth network was set in place, a network from all the ministries uh, of health from European countries working together to, to form uh, um, agreements and, and um, roadmap for digitalization uh, in the health sector. Another important project was 2016, the Assess CT, uh, a project that looked at SNOMED CT for uh, cross-border data exchange and uh, the European EHR exchange format already was mentioned as well, so I don't deep dive in that. That was 2019. And now here comes the, the span between 2019 and the European Health Data Space Regulation that was put in place, which is the time span kind of we're addressing today. So in 2019, um, there was the question of how can we make uh, data exchange uh, possible um, between Europe and countries. Here I put the German flag in, but of course it's all the European countries that were exchanging data. And uh, in, in a project, um, the eHealth Action, a group of member states came together and discussed for about a year to formulate a strategy uh, how to address this. And this is the common semantic strategy for health in the European Union. It's a document. We have a link in the slides uh, that you can take a look at them uh, later on that really laid the groundwork for um, what we're talking about today. Um, 
this paper included creating a group under the eHealth network, a permanent or a five-year permanent committee to um, uh, develop uh, the strategy further and um, to really make something um, practical put in place for the domains of data exchange that um, uh, the, the e, uh, e, e -H -R -X -F. <laughs> I hate this abbreviation, I always stumble with it, so uh, that this would put in place. So uh, if you want to take a look at the, the ideas that are behind this, uh, the paper is publicly available, you can take a look. That was the five-year work plan that we gave us. Uh, the group started um, late 2019, I think it was November, and at that time uh, I um, was very honored to become the chair, the first chair of this group, and I led it for four years. So you see the five years for the initial period that the group was put in place, what we put on our agenda in 2019. So we wanted to work on the patient summary. There was a guideline on patient summary, but it was very short and um, very vague. So we wanted to be more detailed on that. We wanted to work on e-prescription and e-dispensation, uh, laboratory re reports, image reports, and hospital discharge reports. So you will probably see these uh, domains coming up later in the slides as well. You heard some of them before as well. So um, we wanted to as well have a structured common approach on health semantics. So it was not only about working on these guidelines, but to really have an underpinning structure that semantics would, uh, would go for. And we would, uh, of course, give guidance to uh, the decision of uh, the eHealth networks on semantics. Uh, there was the idea to have an evaluation of the work in year four and then to see in year five how to uh, continue with this. Now with the EHDS uh, regulation being in place, which was not uh, envisioned in 2019, we have not uh, undertaken this task. So this was the structure uh, where the subgroup on semantics came in and you can see the structure in the EU on groups and committees and so on is quite complex. Uh, it's in the paper, this, uh, docu uh, this picture here, so if you want to look at it in more detail, uh, take a look, but we will dive, dive a little bit more into the actual structure. Here are the links and the link to the eHealth network, another important uh, thing to look at. And with that, I would hand over for Daniel for now. Uh, so thank you, Stephanie. Uh, so we've both been in charge of herding the semantic cats of, of Europe for uh, some years now. Um, I was the previous rapporteur, uh, that is the, like, the next in line. Uh, but what is the uh, subgroup on semantics of the health network? This shows like a, 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 like a governance diagram <clears throat> and we have the, do I have a lace? I don't, I don't, I don't have a laser, that doesn't work. So you see uh, there is a green box where it says eHealth network and, and the green parts of this is the strategic uh, uh, element. So the eHealth network was a voluntary uh, scheme, uh, but it had a number of uh, subgroups for different uh, topics. So subgroup on semantics was one of those. Uh, and I will talk about that. We also have the operative part of, uh, of this structure, uh, which is called My Health at the EU, and we will hear more about that tomorrow. Um, but now on to the subgroup on semantics. So uh, the subgroup on semantics receives a mandate from the eHealth network, and the eHealth network, that's the member states, just as, as uh, Stephanie uh, told you uh, before. One of the main tasks of this subgroup is to develop maintain and assess, make assessments related to something called eHealth Network Guidelines. And uh, eHealth Network Guidelines uh, are like business level requirements for information. Uh, it started with a focus on cross-border but has been widened since. We now have six guidelines produced, uh, if you remember from Constantine's uh, presentation earlier today, there were uh, five to six areas of the EHR exchange format. Uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, the you know the you've heard them before is patient summary, e prescriptions, e dispensations, lab imaging, and uh, uh, hospital discharge reports. So we have produced guidelines, or at least the first version uh, of the guidelines for all of those, and then we have something called the general guidelines, which is supposed to set the framework of the other guidelines. All these are accessible as well. We the links are uh, in the slide afterwards. Uh, what like we're of course immensely proud uh, of having produced these guidelines, but uh, I think even more important that we've been able to maintain the existing ones. So while there've been uh, a couple of new guidelines, there we also produced ten versions, ten different versions of all these six guidelines. We have task forces which do the actual work, and we also discuss discuss other uh, related. Topic. So the 60% EU discount that was also on the for discussion in the subgroup some some years ago uh, uh, before the decision was made by the Commission. <coughs> Work plan for 2024. We're in this uh, uh, situation now where we have this new regulation which just passed, and. Uh, uh, so, and, and like the future is, is what we do know is that the EF network will cease to exist at least uh, 2030. Uh, so we need to consider uh, how would the role of like the guidelines, the subgroup and so on be uh, going forward uh, with the new uh, legislation. But in order to prepare for that, we need to know where we are. So we did work on checking the consistency in the guidelines, so that make sure that we are in a good position to hand hand this over. Uh, we are uh, <coughs> describing the processes and the results of our work uh, to uh, to make that more formal, also to be able to hand this over uh, to whatever comes after us in in the. In the under the new legislation. So, uh, just to describe how interoperability works and how we work in the the different um, parts of the organization I showed earlier. So, we we talked about the eHealth Network guidelines. This is an example. This is a patient summary. It's at least the front page of the uh, of the patient summary. Uh, when that has been adopted by the member states, which like happened for all of these six guidelines, uh, there is work done uh, to make that, to implement that, and that could happen in the member states, but it could also happen on the joint European level by the My Health at the EU structure, the operational, the purplish in the, in the diagram before. And they're building something called a requirements catalog. There is further detail is added to the guideline. Uh, but we're still on the, because this is a terminology conference, we are still talking about code systems. Uh, the next level, uh, there are more levels, but I will uh, keep this short. I'll try at least. Uh, so uh, it's the implementation guides. And currently we're using HL7 CDA for the cross-border services, uh, e-prescriptions and patient summary. And there the value sets are are uh, like agreed on and set uh, by the My Health at EU groups. So, if we look into uh, uh, eHealth Network guideline, we have like textual parts making up this requirements. This is just an example article level on terminology, but that is also uh, something called the data set, and that is the data elements that make up. Uh, the, the core of the information sharing. Uh, and when it comes to, so this is from the patient summary allergy, uh, when it comes to code systems in uh, the guidelines from version three in 2019, around that time, the notion of a preferred code system was added. Previously, there were no codes in the guidelines. So we added that in, in, uh, in the, uh, the first, uh, the version three of uh, patient summary and e-prescription. So here, for example, allergy manifestation, there is SNOMED TPS so far. See when if that changes. And for problem description, you can see that there is a set of terminologies that are used, that may be used, uh, but then it's 
later stages that decide on the actual value sets. SNOMED in the guidelines. So SNOMED is used in all but the e-prescription guideline and the general guideline doesn't have any code system at all. And so like allergens, vaccines, implants, procedures, pregnancy, SNOMED is used. Uh, we did a small survey of eight EU and like countries which were both EU and SNOMED members. And uh, like five out of these eight uh, which participated in the survey, they had SNOMED in the national specifications which would support the, the, the guidelines and, and the information sharing across Europe. But this ranged from having like seven data elements SNOMED coded to 30 data elements. Uh, for comparison, uh, like you could see, MyFATU has another set of SNOMED value sets. Uh, the IPS has uh, a, a few other uh, SNOMED value sets and like HL7 laboratory fire IG which is a recent product that uh, is being investigated to be used for lab sharing in Europe it has 10 SNOMED value sets so there is there is SNOMED already at this level uh, in the guidelines So I'll take over. I hope you're not all sleeping after lunch. So we make this little interaction here to wake you up. So these are the documents. Uh, again, there is uh, the link to where you can find the documents. And you can see there is one document on the right side, which we did not talk about, about uh, as guideline. But because the group started its work end of 2019, one of the key things that we had to work on not planned was a uh, digital COVID certificate, which uh, we think is a huge uh, success story uh, of how uh, such digital exchange could support uh, European member states. So I think um, the whole commission, the whole, all the member countries, everybody was involved and we developed a value set for that as well, which was used in all the small QR codes you might have used when you did cross-border exchange, when you went to a restaurant or wherever in your country this was used. So this is another thing we worked on and with that one we saw if we really get together and we discuss and we can argue all things out and agree on a, a common set, it does work. So it really gave us some push in, in moving this forward. As, uh, as Daniel said, um, there is the general guideline on this list as well, which I did not have on the, on the previous slide. It's like the overarching umbrella and uh, it sets the tone for it. So if you want to get some idea of how the whole structure is set up, that would be a good one to start with as well. One last thing to mention on these, uh, these domains here uh, is the patient summary. We did uh, uh, try very hard to be in line with the IPS so that we're not only having the, the European, uh, but as well the worldwide uh, application of the IPS possible with this guideline. Now, if you look at the regulation that has uh, been published for the European health data space, again, you see in Article 5 the same domains. So, uh, the work that uh, has been done for the guidelines leading up to this is reflected now in the domains here. So, we would expect that the guidelines as we have them now would be at least a basis for the implementing acts of these domains. So, which means that in the timeline that Constantine has laid out, uh, this starting to be implemented 2026, uh, that this would be in place then, um, and hopefully the work we have done as the subgroup uh, really is um, helping this. And you see again here at Code Systems, I think it was on your slide as well, uh, Constantine, so I'm not going to go into that. And a change again. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've uh, added some animation. So this is this uh, slide you saw before, but I, I tried to overlay the, uh, the, the new structure. So what will happen uh, uh, with the new legislation? And, and the answer is we don't know. Uh, we know that the uh, EF network, that is the voluntary collaboration between member states, will be replaced by the ED, uh, EHDS board. Uh, well, there will be a steering group for uh, my health at the EU, corresponding to the current uh, operative structure. Uh, we have a stakeholder forum, uh, well, it's like we have a stakeholder group, which is being replaced <coughs> with a stakeholder forum. And there is in the legislation the possibility to add subgroups to the EHDS board. And 
but that's to be determined which subgroups there will be. Uh, so with that, you want to? You want to start? Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, like standardization, how could you please have got yeah, okay. stuck? I'll <laughs> Sorry. I'll take that one. Okay, so we think that uh, really standardization is the key in, uh, in, in this whole uh, enterprise of bringing data flow from country to country together. And uh, if there is no agreement on international standards, data flow will be hindered at the border. So it's very important um, to, to, to make sure we align. And SOMED CT will play a major role in this, as you have seen in the, in the, um, in the previous slides. And if we don't do this, this would really... Uh, be a burden on every country. So sharing the standards means sharing the workload as well. So it makes it easier for every country uh, to, to make use of the data and to implement this. You want to do the second? Yeah, uh, that's, that's fine. Uh, so uh, like we, we need to join forces and we have the, the communities exist already. We have the, the uh, European community with like currently we have the uh, EF network uh, that is set up that will be replaced by another community. Uh, we have the semantics community within that uh, that group that we need to uh, consider going forward. But we also have, like when it comes to terminology and particularly when it comes to, to uh, SNOMED, we have a rich SNOMED community which could also help in, in progress uh, the implementation of all these uh, specifications that goes with the European health data space. You want to do one more? Uh, yeah, so uh, we like as SNOMED members I'm putting on our, our, our national hats, uh, we've like invested in, in, uh, in using SNOMED nationally. We also want to use SNOMED uh, cross-border for sharing. Uh, we are, are really happy uh, to see that there is progress on the use of full SNOMED in the master value set catalog. It would have been uh, a challenge uh, to sell SNOMED to our national users if we need to go up one level to the free set when communicating within Europe. So I think that's that's really uh, uh, a benefit for SNOMED use, both in your cross-border, but also nationally. Yeah, and I really would like to do the last one. <laughs> that's quite dear to my heart, uh, this message, really. We've been talking about primary uh, use of data, cross-border data sharing, and so on. But the EHDS has the secondary data uh, capacity as well. And so what is very important in the whole discussion that we're having now is that we're not thinking about the one domain and then the other domain, but the two of them are linked. And so with SNOMED CT, you have a lot of ability to make use of secondary uh, data if it's structured in SNOMED and do all these requests. And with the hierarchy behind it, you have a lot of potential for, for research questions with SNOMED. So in looking at the generation of uh, data for cross-border and for uh, for how to collect the data, you already set the scene for the secondary data use as well. Vice versa, people doing secondary data use need to engage with primary data collectors. So it's uh, something where we think as ending our talk today, we would give the message uh, to the SNOMED in Europe community as well that it's not only the one or the other to talk about, but to think of the two domains together and um, as well in the EHDS, not to separate the two, but to really look at this as a whole. And with that, I think we'll stop. No more changing here. Carry on. I think one of the messages I'm getting out of this is that the dance of the bureaucrats in Europe is really beginning to make things happen, actually. And it's really refreshing to see these things now 
for, you know, that have been around for years in sort of different components, but beginning to deliver stuff that when we go back to our various institutions, we can actually work on and deliver. Anyway, our um, third presentation uh, this afternoon is from, where is he, Felipe. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for coming all the way from Portugal. And just a reminder, you have to keep to time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Charles. And, and thank you for, for having me. And yeah. OK. Yes, so good afternoon, everyone. So I come from Portugal. And I come from a very, I'm suspicious to say this, but from a very interesting organization, which is SPMS, and we do a lot of things. So indirectly, we help the ministry to regulate ICT systems. We are a software house, so we develop systems to then, that we then place on the market. We are an uh, e-procurement agency, so we procure something like three to four uh, billion euros per year. And we are more recently a direct healthcare provider. So we do a lot of things. And one of the things that we do is that we operate a national platform under which uh, digital services by the Ministry of Health are provided. Now, most of these digital services have some sort of legal obligation behind them, but we operate and we manage this platform. And everything that's, every bit of information that, ex, that is exchanged in this platform is exchanged as an event, and it's exchanged at a very low uh, granularity level. So for instance, the um, checking of a patient information by consulting the patient ID in the master patient index is an operation that we, that we uh, allow on this platform. And so we provide digital services on top of this uh, structure. At every day at a national level, we have something like 3 million exchanges. And in order for healthcare providers to have access to these services, they need to use a software that is compliant with them. So we run a compliance program, and if that software is able to uh, exchange data with this platform, then the healthcare providers can enter into agreements with SPMS to use these services, and they can enter into bilateral agreements with one another to exchange information. It is actually through this platform that we also exchange information with Europe. So the uh, Patient summary, for instance, which is one of these services, we collect the information nationally, and then it is through this platform that we exchange information with the My Health at EU infrastructure. And so the way that this operates is really based on a more technical level, based on fire exchanges and on snowmans to support for the semantic structuring. And so we publish implementation guides, and this is the, uh, an example of an implementation guide that we'll be launching next week uh, related to the exchange of allergy information. So the idea is if you are registering an allergy, doesn't matter where you are in the ecosystem, private, social or public health care, if you are using an, uh, an EHR system that can register this information, then they will use this platform in real time to send this data over to the uh, national uh, infrastructure. Then this can be used to uh, generate stuff like the patient summary. And Snowman is a very big part of this. So we operate under a dictionary approach. So we provide dictionaries along with these services, we provide these value sets, and then as a part of our compliance check, we make sure that people are using them appropriately. And right now, 87% of our dictionaries use SNOMED, and this number will increase because when we launch the newer version of the radiology um, catalog, we will be launching it with SNOMED. And SNOMED plays a big part in 
managing the ecosystem. So these value sets play a very important part, not only for clinical purposes, but also for providing uh, structured data that allows us to manage everything. So for instance, if you are setting up an appointment, the type of appointment that you can set up, that is coded in, in SNOMED. So this is what we have so far, but then the HDS regulation comes along and it very briefly it says that, well, if you want as a software vendor to place products on the market, this is a market regulation, not a healthcare regulation, then you need to comply with these requirements. They can be guidelines, they can be technical specifications, they can be very, very granular, very detailed. And what does this mean? So this is the current landscape. So the commission regulates, as Daniel was showing, how the interactions between the MyHealth at EU infrastructure should happen between countries. But if you take a look at what's going on inside your country, then we are all different. So every single country is implementing different APIs, different ways to collect the information and send it to that infrastructure. And what this means is a very heterogeneous uh, ecosystem for the vendors to navigate. So the HDS stands to challenge this. But by standing to challenge this, this also means that it stands to challenge our national architectures or national implementations. Every single software on the market needs to comply with this, with these specifications. So this, of course, has an implication on how we use SNOMED and the importance of what Daniel and Stephanie uh, were saying just before me. And it brings up uh, quite a lot of questions. One of which I would like to, to highlight is that member states are, um, uh, they have the ability to expand beyond what is defined as the minimal requirements under the EHDS. However, how to make this compatible <coughs> with the disposition that states that no additional requirements can be uh, proved to be an obstacle to the market placement of an EHR system, that's an interesting um, thing that, that, that we are discussing. And of course, this also brings up a lot of opportunities. So it provides patients, citizens, all of us, with the rights to have access to our data and to demand it anywhere in the system and for sure you all know what's what's written there and for sure SNOMED plays a, a very important role on, on the semantic side of, of, of things. But let me challenge some of uh, these ideas uh, for you or with you. So I would argue to say that our current EHR systems are quite outdated on a general basis, they are quite obsolete. So if you have been using AI tools like GPT, you see what I mean. So using free text is a lot easier and free speech is a lot easier than trying to find the right uh, uh, value to input data from. The challenge is that at least from the ones of us that are using this dictionary approach is that it doesn't fit quite so well with the usage of free text. Of course, as a regulator, you can still define the envelopes. Of course, you can still define the values that you admit to fill in the spaces of those envelopes. But how do these two worlds uh, uh, fit together? How can a change in one of these dictionaries actually affect the algorithm that is taking and transforming free text into coded data using SNOMED uh, <coughs> behind the engine. And how can we assess that everything is running along smoothly? So the compliance checks that I was stating before, how can we reimagine them in this new uh, paradigm, in this new uh, approach? But 
regardless of the answers to these questions, uh, I think that Snowman will undoubtedly play a very, very big uh, role in the years to come. And with that, I thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Olivia. That's really interesting and a conversation I have almost every day about is it going to be free text? Is it going to be structure? How do we make the two go together? So our final speaker for this session is Elise de Groot. Where's Elise? Oh, there you are. So the floor, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Elsa de Groot, and I'm from Nictis, from the Netherlands. Um, I'm working at the Terminology Center as a terminologist uh, at Nictis. Uh, Nictis is doing more than just, just terminology. Nictis is also developing information standards and um, uh, clinical building blocks, and also is a knowledge center. So we are just a small part of, of Nictis, but a very important part, of course. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the struggles in the Netherlands, <laughs> uh, how to how we are implementing the, the standards. Uh, I'm going to start with the fit cap analysis we have done. Oh, I'm not going to. Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about some base terminologies and I'm going to talk about the Dutch nomad advice. Uh, unfortunately, this is not a, the last slides I gave. <laughs> so if I'm going to use this presentation, I'm going to spend a half an hour, I think. <laughs> um, I'm going to skip some slides here. Uh, we all know about the ESGS that is uh, in place now. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have a uh, kind of national uh, EHCS, it's called the Regis. Uh, it's a Dutch legislation on di digital information exchange. Um, it's an agreement uh, between um, the ministry uh, and the parties, uh, uh, the health professionals. Uh, it's passed the uh, chamber in uh, April 23, so that's one year ago, and uh, it's a step-based approach. Uh, we have some prioritized domains. It's the patient summary, it's the nursing discharge, and it's the medical imaging, uh, the medication, that's also the e-prescription and the dispensation, uh, and uh, emergency care. Um, so together they make a very strong pair, they, uh, the ECS reinforces the, uh, the VEGIS, uh, so together we can, uh, we have a roadmap uh, for the Netherlands. Uh, we did a fit cap analysis, uh, so we, uh, we uh, looked at what is in the VEGIS and we looked at what's in the ECS. Uh, we found some fits and we found some caps. Um, so the patient summary is, um, is an, a fit, uh, that's where we started with. Uh, so we are part of PSO. Um, since 2022 we can receive uh, the patient summary from other countries like Estonia uh, and Portugal. <coughs> and we are now working um, on the uh, uh, sending of the patient summary to other countries. Um, the focus is on primary care. Uh, that's a logical choice when you look at the central point, the primary care is. Uh, also because the primary care is in our infrastructure, national infrastructure, so that has a connection with uh, NCP, with uh, uh, the contact point. So 
It seems like a logical choice, but uh, when you look at the standards, it's not that logical because they are using uh, very much local standards. Uh, so it was a very much a struggle to, um, uh, yeah, we, uh, we needed a lot of mappings or no mappings at all. Uh, so we did a fit cap analysis on the patient summary uh, of the Netherlands and the uh, EU. Uh, the first uh, problem we came around was the problem ICPC-1 derived um, codes they use uh, in the primary care. Um, so we needed actually ICD-10 or SNOMED uh, in the MVC. Uh, also the countries, uh, we use local codes for the medication. We have a local system, um, a dose form and uh, route of administration uh, are in our medication system. And the observations uh, lab um, of the primary care is uh, a totally mess. It's, uh, it's a table with around um, 9,000 codes. Um, yeah, we couldn't do anything with that. So we have two no maps here. Um, the first no, no map of the problem, we can send the English text with a no flavor but the observations we cannot, uh, yeah, we can do nothing with. Uh, so our conclusion of this one is we need work to do. Uh, we need uh, uh, more uh, international codes in the primary care patient summary. Uh, the roadmap of Netherlands is that, that we want to go to three uh, base terminologies. Uh, it's uh, SNOMED, of course, it's LOINC, and it's uh, IDMP-based. Um, in the Netherlands, we call this uh, model of PIM the Mickey Mouse model. Uh, there's one controversial um, um, decision we uh, want to make, and it's that, that, it's that we don't want any more mappings. It relates to the question of Robert uh, earlier uh, this uh, in the morning. Um, and uh, now we, uh, from our experience, uh, mappings are uh, very cost effective. Um, a lot of information loss and uh, a maintenance burden. So uh, as long as it's, it's possible, we, we, want, we don't want any more mappings and we want to uh, use reference sets as SNOMED reference sets uh, at the source. Of course, this is except for secondary use and historical data. Uh, we don't want to do everything at the same time, so we want to start with the implementation of SNOMED. Uh, the Ministry of Health asks us to uh, write a SNOMED advice. So how are we going to get SNOMED implemented in? The Netherlands, so we did write that SNOMED advice. Uh, it's an hands on SNOMED advice, uh, and it's actually uh, the meaning that we are working together with, with all professionals to achieve the standardized terminology. Okay, go ahead, I can skip this one. I delete this one. So why do we want this SNOMED advice? There are several um, uh, documents written, um, initiatives that uh, made the ministry uh, ask us to write this SNOMED advice. Uh, the first is the vision um, of standardized terminology. It was written in 2018. Uh, it was also uh, the Mickey Mouse model in there. And if we uh, look at, at now, we are now five years, no more, six, seven years further, we don't see more implementations uh, to now less implementations of SNOMED. Uh, so this was one reason. Uh, there was also an impact assessment on uh, standardization SNOMED. Uh, there, um, uh, there was uh, looked at how, uh, why SNOMED is implemented, is implemented in SNOMED. Uh, why is nobody is implemented? Uh, the answers of that was that there were barrier barriers on implementation, uh, lack of vision, lack of direction. The added value is not really clear. 
and we have to collaborate more with suppliers. So this was um, uh, these recommendations uh, we took uh, within our economic advice. And the last one is agreements between uh, Ministry of Health and uh, uh, parties to have patient data easily available, accessible and reusable. Uh, standardized clinical terminology is also in there. It also is in there that each sector will deliver implementation plans no later than six months after the final publication of the advice report that was implemented, uh, published uh, uh, last month. So the Snowmed advice is a step-by-step -step transformation and it really is a transformation for a lot of health professionals in the Netherlands. Uh, so how are we going to do this? Uh, what are we going to do? We can implement SNOMED, there's no discussion about that. Um, uh, it's for six, 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 six sectors, uh, uh, make SNOMED mandatory in the long term, and uh, start with diagnosis and, and treatment. So these two uh, components. Uh, an important one is to involve suppliers and technology, uh, also HI, of course. Uh, we need money, um, we need to uh, educate uh, professionals, and we need to communicate the value of SNOMED. Uh, so start with the diagnosis and treatment, uh, the development of reference sets, uh, that's um, a responsibility of the field itself, so they, they have to make their reference sets, they have to maintain their reference sets, and they have to uh, publish their reference sets when they want to. Uh, at the moment, we are doing that, but we are going to stop doing that. Uh, they have to col collaborate in the field team, um, so the reference sets are also aligned. Uh, suppliers, I just thought. It's a step-by-step -step coordination. It's really a change and transformation. Uh, so collaborate per sector, solving complex issues together, so working together, and we as NICTIS provide help and support. So, we don't want to do everything at once, so we start small, because you can't eat an elephant in one bite. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you so, so much for coping with getting the wrong slides. So apologies for that, but um, uh, well done. And a really interesting set of presentations and open to all of you to, for questions, thoughts, comments. There's an amazing amount of stuff written into all of those presentations. Um, Thank you all of you for the talk. Um, I just had a question which came up, especially with Els's talk, is that it now seems that the bottom-up approach isn't working, and that it's when governments step in, when European governments step in, and actually put their foot down, that things are actually happening. I'd like to hear your comments about that. Do you want to comment on that? I didn't uh, hear the last sentence. Can you repeat? <laughs> that it's not a bottom-up approach which is working, but that it is the governments, not just national, but also European, yes. that are putting their foot down and saying, you need to implement this full stop. Yes, it's true. It's not like uh, like a... Uh, uh, fully mandatory, but they do it with the fields, but it is uh, with the ministry, yes. Felipe, do you, do you want to comment on how, you've, how you're going to get the Portuguese to all do what you say? So, we, we tend to work based on the opportunity. So, that, that's the first thing. So, if the opportunity isn't there, don't bother with semantics and don't start working. Uh, and what I mean by this, if 
there isn't the will to change the market, to change the processes, to change people, then don't bother with semantics. It's take, it takes too long of you, it takes a lot of effort for it to be uh, stuck on a drawer. Um, to my experience, what really works are obligations. And unfortunately to say, to my experience, what really works is to get to the money. If you comply with this, you'll get reimbursed. If you don't comply with that, you don't get reimbursed. Um, but ultimately, that, that's a not so positive message. The, the more positive message is this. So working for the opportunity, the right opportunity for me means working for the right digital services to be laid down. Supporting those services, we need to have a good semantic structuring. The adequate people, at least in Portugal, are already in the... Our current mindset is SNOMED first, and we can see how we can top it up. Um, but we are working on a, a SNOMED first approach. That's underneath supporting that service. So there is not the need to be constantly explaining to everyone why we are doing it that way. Uh, we understand we can justify it if people want to know why, but ultimately people will understand why when they start to explore data. And that hasn't happened yet, only on very small focused uh, fields. Once that starts to happen, you don't need to, under to, to explain the why anymore. Daniel, your it, European or Swedish experience? Um, Bit of uh, uh, start with some Swedish experience, so money doesn't work either. Uh, if you sh change the reimbursement, all, all of a sudden the incidence of cancer uh, is uh, increasing and so on. So that, that, there, there are no easy solutions to, uh, to this. I, I think uh, maybe putting a more European hat on, uh, would be the, like the, the part that was also in, in our presentation, the joining of forces. So uh, if bottom-up doesn't work, and, and it, like there's been several bottom-up projects uh, that have shown very good results, but are not like widespread, and there are uh, like failures of, of too much top-down as well. So uh, and and just joining forces uh, we need the support from the bottom to get the, the relevant information standardized prioritized and so on but we also need someone who says that like puts the foot down and says this is what what like what what you need to implement and hopefully we are getting there with the uh, European health data space. We probably sort out the, the legislative part, the, the top part. Uh, the concern would be getting the stakeholders involved to a sufficient degree on, on, on getting the bottom uh, to join in this, this huge, this, which could become a huge force. Thank you. Stephanie? Yeah, maybe a slightly different perspective. I think uh, First thing is you need to have an ear on the ground and hear what are the needs. And I think what uh, Elsa presented is this uh, listening to the users. And then uh, in your review you did, I, I saw this one bullet point, there was no clear vision. And I think that is what putting it into legislation or putting it in some writing is, is really giving the users a vision what will be the case in the long run. So. Um, mandating or going into a national strategy for SNOMED CT really gives the vendors, the implementers, the way forward that they can rely on. Because if it's just something they hear and they don't know, will it be the next thing or will it be something that lasts just for a year and there, there is something else coming up, they won't invest. It's super expensive to change a system and it will only pay out in the long run. So having this vision, I think, is the key part. And for a government to put a vision in place, sometimes it needs to be in legislation so that it's a clear, mandatory kind of way that you follow. Just writing a paper on a vision 
is not sometimes enough for, for the implementers to pick up the money and, and, and the workforce to implement it. So I think it's, it's not something that you can do from top down by just, I decide I want to do this. It's, it's the bottom up is hearing what the users need and then putting this in a kind of a vision for a way forward kind of makes it sound in solid. So it's, it's both ways, I think. So I agree with that very strongly, Stephanie. I think one of the things that makes a big difference in the UK is when the government actually issues an information standard notice, as it's, uh, as it's called. That forces the vendors to do something. And many of them say they won't respond, even if they know it's the right thing to do, until there is an ISN issued. So that's an important component. The other component I think I've seen over the last few years um, is the development of health information exchanges. And where, frankly, clinicians don't want to swap PDFs. They want to swap stuff you can read in 30 seconds, 15 seconds. And that's not a PDF, because you've got to open it, and then you've got to read a whole bunch of free text. So however much we all love that free text stuff, the reality is, in practice, you want a list of codes. And you want to be able to exchange them easily. And I think health information exchanges make a big difference to the mood of people working across sectors, whether it's primary care and secondary care, or secondary care and tertiary care and so on, or, dare I say it, and at lunchtime I spoke to some uh, nurses from Leuven, I think the opportunities in some of the other professions for developing the use of coding systems for the exchange of health data for care of patients in the home, in the hospital, and so on, doesn't come from doctors. It comes from other professions. And we don't push hard enough on that aspect, in my view. Um, oh, I'm glad. I please somebody. Um, so, uh, so there's a question. Oh, over there. And then, and then Paul, and then we'll have to stop, I think. Oh. <coughs> Two more. Oh, yeah. Thank you. For those who don't know me, I'm Julie, and I do drugs. <laughs> so I particularly noticed, and, and of course I'm aware, that uh, in the International Patient Summary and in the e-prescribing, you're not using the SNOMED uh, drug model and the SNOMED drug content. And you know we know that 80% of the treatments of patients are using medicines. And it's one of the largest areas for um, iatrogenic uh, accidents. And it's one of the largest areas that we need for secondary use of data. Um, could I have your comments, please? <laughs> Thank you. So first, I, I can't refrain. Probably some would say that you are addicted to drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, uh, the I, I think the issue there uh, for the for the time being is that we have uh, uh, like competing terminology in use or being implemented in Europe. So that's the the short question, um, a short answer to the to the question. Uh, there, uh, as a part of uh, developing the the uh, the basis for the future implementing acts under EHDS, there is a, a project called XTHR. I don't know. I think that was on some of the slides earlier. Uh, that it, that and that is particularly looking at uh, what are the specifications that we are going to use for. Uh, uh, for sharing data about medications. I think one of the issues in that space that I'm, I'm probably has been addressed a lot, but maybe not enough, is the difference between a regulatory perspective and the clinical perspective on, on drugs. So uh, in the, the current version uh, of the e-prescription guideline from uh, eHealth Network, uh, I so we do have like and this was maybe four four years ago. Uh, we hope that the 
uh, the terminologies that would be developed in Europe by European Medici Medicines Agency would support the clinical use as well. Now we need to, um, I, I guess, in the, uh, the, the project that is now ongoing, uh, evaluate the use of our code systems. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, there are several in the audience here, and you probably know them all, uh, who participate in that. Uh, so, yeah, that was a slightly longer response. Thanks very much, Daniel. And a question from Paul Seegers. The first a comment and a question. So, the comment was the discussion we have about uh, money. I must say it's always a long stretch. Um, when we started, let's say, in our niche for pathology in, uh, with uh, standard reporting, uh, it is, you should see it as an oil stain. So we did it from bottom up. And now we see that the reimbursement organization says, okay, we see so much uh, profit from this, also for administration burden, uh, less in hospitals, uh, quality of uh, registries are going enhanced. Uh, etc., and also for the daily care. So um, uh, finally, they will profit. And in this case, Snowmed City will just tag along. So, and that makes for this niche in, in the Netherlands, and I think that will could be for many cases, of many countries, but also for radiology, uh, for instance, could be the case to do it. But it uh, takes a long breath. And now my question, of course, I was triggered uh, uh, with the presentation of Philip. Um, I saw with um, the slide where um, a lot of uh, Snowbed CT um, disciplines uh, were there, but I missed, of course, pathology. And uh, <laughs> I just recently uh, did an article with uh, Katerina Eloy from uh, Portugal. And so I know that there is a lot of uh, interesting in, in uh, Portugal about this. So what are your connections with pathology for this? So our uh, I cannot. <laughs> so our our, uh, our current implementation. Well, of course, I focused I focused SNOMED uh, here today, um, but our current implementation and our current value sets, if I am not mistaken, already account for pathology. So if you see the uh, lab. Um, the lab catalog that we have published and I can give you the link but it's also in the slides you will find that there are uh, specific values there that uh, allow for the coding of, of uh, pathology um, yeah that's <laughs> so Paul I think so, job done in Portugal for pathology <laughs> but you, you may have to take him up at tea time on that one um, so, can I thank all four speakers, Stephanie, Daniel, Felipe, Elsa, really great and provoking um, uh, um, presentations. And so, thank you very much, and perhaps you could rejoin your... <laughs>